Excellent. Very good. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we uh, resume from previous lecture. Uh, so today we'll go through uh, a quick summary um, of uh, what we uh, achieved yesterday and uh, some more considerations on uh, how to perform exploration in a uh, reasonable, effective way. Uh, mostly focusing on bandits as our test bed example. Um, and then in the second part, we move to the back to the full uh, uh, reinforcement learning problem. Uh, and we will just discuss uh, a few uh, kind of algorithms that can be adopted uh, to uh, uh, learn uh, without a model how to control uh, an MDP. OK, so uh, but uh, first things first, uh, let's uh, uh go back to our uh summary of results so starting out from, uh, from yesterday so what we have seen in is that uh, uh um that uh we can implement the general idea of uh, control uh in absence of a model uh, by basically uh um, setting up uh, uh an algorithm which works uh, as follows. So we, uh, it's a loop by which we uh, uh, start out with some uh, uh, estimate uh, for our Q function. Okay, so at the beginning it could be a, just a, a blank slate, all values set to zero or all values set to random. Uh, of course, the the point where you start from as in, as a definitely. A lot of importance uh, in terms of performance, in the sense that the closer you are to the optimal solution, the quicker will uh, your learning be. Uh, but uh, you start from uh, from some guess anyway, uh, which might or might not encode your prior knowledge uh, about the system. And uh, the first and, and most important thing is that from starting from that knowledge, uh, you derive some policy. Okay, so this is. A policy which is derived from uh, 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 your estimate of the Q function. Uh, and here there are several choices, and we will discuss some of them uh, today. Uh, the main and most important idea is that uh, if you had perfect knowledge of the optimal value function, you would choose the policy greedily. Okay, so you would pick out the action which maximizes. Uh, your uh, expected uh, return. But the point is that this is just an estimate, so you're not allowed to do that. If you do this, you fall into traps, okay? So your experience might lead you to believe uh, that you are uh, uh, performing, that are choosing the best action, but this is not in fact the case. And if you uh, just uh, uh, go full throttle for the option that seems to be the best, you may neglect other options that uh, might turn out to be better, but if you don't visit them, uh, you will never know. Okay, so this suggests that this way of uh, turning uh, estimates of the Q function into policy at each step time, time step uh, must uh, uh, carefully balance uh, exploration and exploitation. So. Uh, Balancing exploitation. Yeah. Exploration. And there will be more on that soon. Uh, once we have a policy, okay, then we can sample our system. So we can observe, we can produce an action. And as a result of this action, we observe rewards and possibly new states more in general. If it's a bandit problem, you just observe rewards, okay, because states don't matter. But in general, you also observe a new state. And uh, given these uh, uh, observations, okay, so this is uh, uh, select an action. And this is observe. And then from this, you construct 
your notion of temporal difference error. which is a measure of the difference in what you have observed and what you would have expected based on your initial estimate here, okay? So given all the steps that you've done before, given the, uh, the estimate, uh, you may also use the policy, et cetera, all these things together can lead you then to compute the temporal difference error. And then you use the temporal difference error to update your estimate. And you can you could do that by using some uh, kind of eligibility trace. So this is uh, the part uh, which involves uh, some credit assignment. That is, you have to give credit or blame the states and actions that you think are responsible for this discrepancy between what you observe and what you predicted uh, that is encoded in the value of the temporal difference error. And uh, in the most simplest uh, situation, you solve this very simple credit, this credit assignment problem in the simplest of ways, that is you give credit to the states and actions that you've just visited. So just what has happened in the very, very recent past. But of course, as you've seen, you can do better, uh, and uh, how better this depends on the details, detailed properties of the underlying uh, environment. So it's not easy to, to understand a, a priori in general. All right. Um, so uh, very good. So that's the general plan. And, uh, and then we, um, that, that's the general scheme of the algorithm that we will be playing. So this loop goes on and on uh, uh, with time. And uh, uh, assuming that uh, you uh, uh, appropriately reduce the learning rate in this step, okay? So this is, in this step, you perform your learning. And in this step, this is where learning takes place. And uh, in this other step here, this is where your uh, updating takes place, or this is where the exploration. Uh, so in, you have to carefully uh, reduce your learning rate and reduce your exploration rate so that eventually your cycling converges to the choice in which uh, your uh, temporal difference learning converges to the actual value of the policy and the policy converges to the greedy policy for the optimal value okay so you have to sort of guide your system slowly to converge towards this point okay so uh that said we uh, we've been looking in detail to what happens uh, if you if you are uh, working with a bandit uh, so this is a, a recap Bandits, which is the simplest situation in which you don't have any states. Uh, so we've been uh, seeing that uh, uh, learning the Q uh, of a given policy uh, is actually a very straightforward process, uh, uh, which basically uh, amounts to uh, uh, if you have a fixed alpha, so if alpha is constant. Uh, then uh, your algorithm simply uh, computes uh, some uh, uh, recency weighted average of your rewards, okay? Uh, for one for each arm, right? So uh, remember that the algorithm here reads just uh, like this. So your new estimate is your previous one. And then here, there is the difference between the obtained reward and the previous estimate as well. Okay, so this is a 
sort of correcting algorithm, uh, which amounts to say that you are doing some uh, <coughs> uh, geometrically and recess, recency weighted average. Okay. So in, in, in particular, uh, uh, if you choose this uh, alpha uh, to be dependent on the arm you choose and going just like one over the number of times that you've chosen that arm so far, plus one, uh, then we've seen that in this case, uh, your uh, estimates actually are nothing but the empirical averages for each arm, okay? So in this very simple case, doing temporal difference learning uh, coincides with just keeping count of the empirical average for each action you take. Okay, so you pull arm one and then you take a record. Okay, I've been pulling arm one, say n one times up to time t, and I've collected a certain number of rewards. Then I take the empirical average. I sum over the, all the rewards that I collected for that arm. I divide by the number of times that I visited that arm. And this is exactly my estimate for the value function of that arm, okay? And you do this in parallel for all the arms you play. Okay. Uh, then, uh, li like I told you earlier, uh, the greedy strategy based on this estimate fails, okay? So this is what we've seen operationally that there are regions in the space of, uh, uh, estimated values uh, in which you don't, you get trapped and you never learn the value of the optimal policy. And therefore you cannot get to the optimal decision-making uh, solution. Uh, so summarizing, this is failure of greedy optimization. Okay. So greedy optimization means that you pick uh, uh, at every step your the, your policy that derived from Q uh, is uh, arg max over A of your current estimate. This is the greedy option. So this is not working. Uh, and, and then we we, uh, we just discussed without any uh, specific uh, proof, but with just a sort of geometrical intuition that one way out uh, for this is to uh, introduce uh, some exploration. Okay, so uh, uh, there are different ways of doing that and we will uh, review some of them, uh, but the basic message is that uh, uh, exploration is needed is actually, uh, Is actually backed up by uh, by a theorem uh, that is a, a result by uh, Lyon Robbins. Who provide a bound, which says that uh, uh, so whichever policy, so whichever strategy you use. Uh, that is good, okay, which uh, has a technical uh, meaning, but uh, in short means that asymptotically, you always choose the right arm, but only asymptotically, okay? So you approach uh, at the best possible rate the, the right arm. Every strategy that is good uh, must visit, must choose, uh, suboptimal options at least uh, with frequency one over time, okay? 
which means that the cumulative number of bad choices must go like the logarithm of time. So this one over T is, a, if you think about it, is, is a relatively slow way of giving away exploration, okay? So of reducing exploration. But if you do it faster than that, basically, uh, you are certain to be confronted with some situations. There will be some situations in which uh, the sequence of events will lead you to believe that your suboptimal R was a, is actually the best one. And therefore, from that moment on, you will stick to that R. Okay. So if you, you don't, you are not allowed to go any faster than uh, one over T in your reducing exploration, in your attempt at reducing exploration. And if you go any slower than that, uh, then there is another price to pay is that uh, you are increasing your uh, uh, regret in the sense that you are playing your suboptimal choices more frequently than you should. Uh, of course, one, uh, one caveat is that uh, the, here there are prefactors. Okay, the prefactors in this are uh, uh, dependent on uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the properties of the system itself. So in particular, uh, the, the precise statement uh, of the uh, line Robbins bound is that uh, uh, as the number of, uh, as time goes by and increases and approaches infinity, uh, the expected number of times that you visit uh, uh, A uh, suboptimal, Okay, so this is not the one where you have the largest mean divided by the logarithm of time. Uh, this must be larger than one over the kullback leibler divergence between uh, uh, the distribution of the suboptimal arm against the distribution of the optimal arm. And this tells you that uh, uh, it's very important to also the value of the constant here, right? So what is on the right-hand side, uh, it's very important. So when you choose what constant to put in front of your uh, uh, exploration scheduling here, here there is a constant, and this constant should be uh, not too small either, okay? Because this constant should be compared with this kullback leibler divergence, okay? So if you choose exactly this rate of going lamb like one over T, you should be also careful about the constant. And the constant is connected to some properties of your system, which you don't know, okay? So this, this limiting value of uh, logarithmic regret, logarithmic uh, number, cumulative number of bad actions uh, is however very fragile. So you, in practice, you should stay a little bit away from it, as close as possible, but not too close because otherwise you may risk of falling on the other side of the boundary, okay? So it's a, it's a sort of a fragile boundary to, to work on. Uh, okay, so very good. Uh, so this, this means that there is some inherent statistical reason for which you cannot explore too little, okay? It's not just that the algorithms aren't good enough. Any, any algorithm which performs well must explore enough. And this statement is made quantitative by this bound. All right, so uh, uh, one way of implementing exploration for real, okay, uh, is for instance, through uh, uh, epsilon greeting. So uh, examples of exploration. One, the epsilon greedy strategy uh, uh, makes a very simple choice. That is that every uh, time the, the policy that you derive at time t from your queue 
uh, it's just uh, uh, given for each R. Okay, it's just given by the following choice. So uh, it's either uh, argmax So let's let's uh, let's write it more properly here because this is not good. So pi t is given by you pick the action a t, which is either the argmax of your q t, so I say t plus one, which is either the argmax of your current uh, vector of estimates. Okay, so for instance, you have all the sample means for the different arms and you pick the arm with the largest sample mean, but you do that only with some probability one minus epsilon, okay? So you reserve some quota of your probability for exploration. Uh, and then you do any, any arm, any action, with probability epsilon. Okay, so uh, what you do in practice is that you uh, you have your epsilon value, uh, you uh, extract a uniform random variable, and uh, if this random variable is above epsilon, then you pick the maximum and you act greedily. But if it's below the maximum, you pick any action between the k actions that you have access to. Okay, so it's a very easy to implement. Uh, one obvious uh, objection is that uh, uh, if, uh, so these are remarks. So if epsilon is constant, uh, exploration never fades, okay? So this is not a good idea. Uh, So this, this is a clear no, because in this case, the number of times in which you choose suboptimal actions grows linearly with time. Okay? Because you always have a fixed probability, no matter how small it is, of picking something which is not optimal. So uh, a better way to do it is to go uh, and schedule epsilon. So I have some epsilon as a function of t. And uh, uh, according to the result that we had, uh, from uh, uh, line robins. So uh, one good idea would be just to uh, choose it uh, uh, decreasing like, uh, for instance, uh, one some uh, uh, one over t one plus some um, exponent, uh, let's say, uh, uh, unfortunately, so many letters are taken that I don't know which one to choose, uh, but let's say sigma. Okay, so with the sigma, which is something which is uh, larger than zero. Okay, so you 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 can make it as small as possible to get as close as possible to the to the limit. Keeping in mind that if you choose exactly equal to zero, then you have to pay attention to the constant that you put here on top. So this is a, a reasonable choice, and in practice, it works pretty well. Uh, Except that it has one uh, disadvantage uh, in that uh, it doesn't make much of a difference between different arms, okay? So uh, you explore with the same rate, no matter which arm you're actually choosing, okay? Uh, on the contrary, it would make more sense to uh, select uh, the greedy the actions when you have visited them many times. And so you are comparatively uh, more certain of the values that they have. And on the contrary, explore more the arms for which you have had less experience. And for them, you expect to be uh, less confident about the values that they have. So this suggests uh, to use uh, 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 rates which depend on time, but also depend on uh, the action you are currently picking, okay? so. Let's think about this thing works. Uh, you, you have several actions available, okay? 
you pick, uh, for instance, one of them, you just select uh, greedily one action, and then you choose how to explore, okay? So there are two steps. You have your estimate, okay? So you have your estimate, then you have your greedy choice, which will give you uh, a tentative uh, action, let's call it a tilde. And then you use, you explore uh, using this exploration rate, okay? So if you happen to fall onto that your greedy choice sends you to an action that has been explored already a lot, then you do that, otherwise you don't, okay? So this allows you to keep uh, more balance between different uh, uh, choices. Then in this case, you, you do something very similar that is you scale this like uh, the number of visit for that arm to the power of one plus. So there are, the bottom line message is that there are several ways of uh, doing exploration, even in the simple epsilon greedy model. Uh, and actually when I write this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, expressions like this, actually I'm, I'm hitting, uh, I'm sweeping under the rug a lot of complexity in the choice because uh, you're actually choosing a functional form for this, okay? So uh, what, what is the power? Uh, but what is the function? Should it be something that uh, goes down like a power law from the beginning or maybe something which is flat and then goes down, okay? There's a lot of, a lot of craftsmanship in designing the way you explore. So all these things are hyperparameters for our learning, okay? Which uh, sometimes needs need to be carefully tuned. Okay. So if you happen to have some practical experience uh, with these algorithms, uh, you, you, might, uh, you might encounter the sort of uh, feeling of dismay at the beginning because, okay, but the algorithm was supposed to work and uh, it's just supposed to converge, but in my hands, it's performing very poorly. In 99% of the cases is because this requires a lot of fiddling with these hyperparameters, okay? So uh, uh, there is this, uh, there's always this uh, little uh, distance between uh, the beauty of the theory and the ugliness of the practice. Uh, so uh, if you happen to work with these things, just think about it. Uh, don't uh, fiddle randomly with parameters. Think about what makes sense and what makes not, uh, why your exploration isn't working and what are what could be the, the, the issues uh, that you're facing, okay? So thinking a, a lot about how your hyperparameters should be adjusted saves you a lot of time in terms of uh, uh, convergence, uh, practical convergence of your algorithm, okay? But this was um, a little bit like uh, a kitchen recipe, so let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, because I want to discuss before the break also other ways uh, of doing uh, uh, exploration. Uh, uh, so beyond, I'm sorry, I'm reading. Uh, so one possible way of uh, doing exploration uh, is to uh, uh, smoothen out uh, the uh, the operation of taking a maximum. Okay, uh, let me break it down uh, uh, for you. But first and foremost, one thing that uh, is not entirely satisfactory, uh, even with this choice here, which is sort of the most refined one, uh, even in this case, uh, we are not completely happy because we are not treating different suboptimal actions differently. So, but this, what, what do I mean? Suppose that you have three actions available, not just two. So there will, one action would be the best one and the other two would be suboptimal. So epsilon greedy, as we write in this here, uh, is actually only considering the number of times that you have visited those actions, which of course, in turn, they depend implicitly on the values that they have. But maybe it's useful to make this dependence more explicit or maybe not, okay? So why don't we explore also independence on, on how suboptimal an action is more explicitly? So yes, it, it's important to 
know how many times you visited that. But if you visited many times and this action is uh, abysmally low, maybe you should take that into account. Maybe it's not just out of bad luck that that particular action has a very, very poor estimate. So it's true that statistics is important, but maybe you're over exploring even in this specific sense. So you could do something better. You could be a little bit more greedy, maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. So one way of uh, uh, approaching these uh, different ways of uh, uh, exploration uh, goes like this. So I will sort of give you this, the basic conceptual steps. Uh, so let's, let's uh, re restart over from... Uh, so greedy means that uh, you are picking uh, basically what you're doing when you're doing greedy, you are taking the maximum overall possible policies or bandits uh, of the sum over all actions for your current estimates. Okay. So this operation here amounts to picking up the action that has the largest Q, okay? It's a simple linear maximization problem. You have a vector Q, which points somewhere, hat Q, your estimate. You have another vector, which is the vector of policies, which is positive, and it sums to one, all the components. And therefore, the best thing that you can do is align your vector in the direction of the largest component, okay? So this is absolutely equivalent to taking the argmax. It's just exactly the same thing as you can easily check. Uh, how can we soften this requirement? Okay, so one possibility would be to do what is called an entropic regularization. So we replace the greedy strategy with this other request. So we want to maximize our policies the same quantity, but now we add a bonus for probabilities which are not to focus on a single action. Okay, so this is constant, where this beta appears as an inverse and uh, beta is uh, strictly larger than zero. Uh, and here we put the entropy of the policy, the Shannon entropy of the policy, which I recall you is defined as sum of all actions. Okay. So you might recall if you had a, some, a little bit of information here, but en Shannon entropy should be familiar to most of you, I think. Uh, that the entropy uh, is always uh, uh, positive, uh, non-negative at least, uh, and uh, it is zero only if uh, uh, pi is deterministic, which means that only if pi is uh, concentrated on a single action. And uh, the maximum, of this is uh, the logarithm of the number of actions, k. Remember that k for us is the number of actions. So probably I've never used this k before, so let's uh, forget about it. Let's put just the number of actions. Okay. And uh, the entropy is maximal uh, only when pi is uniform. Okay, so only when each action, so pi of A is equal to one over the number of actions. These are basic properties of the entropy. And clearly, if we put uh, this, uh, this term here, this is clearly an exploration bonus. Okay, because uh, if you want to maximize the second term, the entropy, you want your probability to be as spread as possible. Whereas the first term tells you to concentrate 
as much as possible on the largest possible on the largest value of your Q vector. So here there is a trade-off, there is a balance between trying to maximize your value and trying to balance this with entropy. Okay. For those of you who have a ground in physics, this is uh, very much what happens when you balance energy and entropy in your free energy. Okay, so there's a connection uh, uh, with statistical physics as well. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the bottom line of this is that if you perform this maximization, which is a, a very straightforward analytic procedure, you can actually find an explicit expression for your policy. And uh, uh, the policy that uh, comes out is, uh, let's call it pi with a subscript capital B, which will become uh, clear in a second. Uh, is just the exponential of beta times your estimate divided by the normalization of this. So we're summing over all possible actions. B this one's from one to the predominant actions. Okay. And this B is, stands for Boltzmann because this is connected to the Boltzmann distribution in uh, statistical physics, uh, which is the same thing, except for a minus sign, because in physics you minimize energies and in uh, machine learning and reinforcement learning you maximize uh, rewards, uh, returns, okay? But apart from that, uh, that's why it's called Boltzmann. And, and this choice is also called Boltzmann exploration. So again, you might think of this beta as sort of an inverse temperature, okay? So if your system uh, wants to align with a certain uh, vector, but then you have some uh, sort of noise in the form of a temperature, an effective temperature, which makes it wander a little bit around, okay? So it's a sort of uh, inter physical, very, very loose interpretation of uh, what this beta parameter means. More seriously, it's a trade-off between these competing uh, requirements of being focused on exploitation. Okay, this is a way to make explicit the balance between uh, exploitation. And exploration. Beware, there's nothing fundamental in this, okay? It's just one intuitive way of writing down this balance, but there's no uh, underlying uh, law of nature by which this should be uh, the, the right way to go. It's one among many. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, even though this approach is widely used, it's unsatisfactory uh, under many respects, okay? Uh, so the first thing is that, uh, okay, let, let's go one step at a time. First of all, clearly, uh, if beta is constant, uh, you're not going very far from the viewpoint of exploration because there will always be exploration, okay? So similarly as for epsilon constant, this is not a solution of your exploration problem because you will keep on exploring. You will be exploring in a way that is different from different arms, Okay, at variance with the situation with epsilon greedy, which randomizes blindly. Here you do this selectively, okay, because your policy depends on your current estimates. So you explore less than what you do with constant epsilon greedy, especially for the very suboptimal arms. But you keep on exploring. Okay, so beta constant, as always. Uh, uh, not enough. So what if we do the scheduling of this inverse temperature? Okay, then uh, it requires a little bit of calculations, but uh, you get to the rather uh, uh, intuitive results that uh, your temperatures should grow 
sorry, your inverse temperatures should grow as the logarithm of time. Remember, uh, if you want to go to the maximum, okay, here there is a way, if you send beta to infinity as a parameter, then this becomes the argmax. Okay, so it's obvious from this, because when beta tends to infinity, this second part disappears and you're back to the argmax. But it's also obvious when you look at the solution, because if you send beta to infinity, there will be just one term that dominates here in this sum. And the term which dominates is the one with the largest estimate, hat q. Okay. So beta tends into infinity means that the temperature is going to zero, if you wish. Okay. So in a sense here, you are cooling down your system very slowly which is a procedure that is known in physics and in statistical physics uh, as a milling. It's something you actually do with materials when you cool them down very slowly in order to prevent them to become amorphous, okay? So if you have uh, a mixture of materials and then you cool them down too rapidly, they might separate, they might so when you produce some materials and you want to have them very homogeneous, you have to maybe to heat them up in order to uh, to make your, your mixture and then uh, you have to cool them down very slowly in order to prevent separation. And this is something which is again very loosely uh, similar to this. And this logarithm of t is something which also you can derive by arguments from statistical physics in case you you're familiar with that. If you're not, it doesn't really matter. This is this log t is, is the corresponding choice of one over t for uh, for the epsilon really algorithm, if you wish. Okay. Um, now again, we are going over. This is also not uh, a good choice because this uh, beta parameter doesn't know which actions are visited more or less. So we are still exploring in a way that does not care about the uncertainty of the estimates. So we have to put into this uh, uh, estimate something that uh, uh, takes care of actions. And the way you do it is just you, now you introduce something which are temperatures for each arm. Notice that this breaks down the connection with entropy, okay, like we did before. So we are departing from that because the entropy requires here all beta to be the same. Now, so now we're making a leap and we say, okay, let's improve on this by introducing some uh, action dependent temperature, so to speak. Uh, and, and then one can, uh, can find out what is the best way of choosing or the one that gives you some uh, theoretical uh, guarantees on how to choose them. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not uh, uh, giving you all the details, but I'm pointing you to uh, a very useful paper, uh, which is called uh, Boltzmann Exploration Done Right. And the authors, uh, the authors, the authors, the authors are Cesar Bianchi, and you can easily find it out in. Uh, in the preprint uh, repositories, uh, it's a it's a NIPS paper, I guess. Yes, NIPS twenty seventeen. Okay. Uh, so one uh, thing that uh, is is interesting uh, in uh, in this approach. Uh, so is that uh, uh, if you just regardless of the way you choose these uh, parameters, uh, uh, 
This is suggesting that you should choose your arms according to your estimates by some choice like this. It's normalized. which you can see as a sort of a tweak softmax uh, choice. Uh, one interesting uh, thing, uh, it, which is a, a mathematical result, uh, is that actually uh, you can uh, turn this softmax into a sharp max by a trick. Okay, this trick, which I'm telling you, it doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, mathematical knowledge, but it's called the Gumbel trick, tells you that uh, uh, the actions that you pick according to this distribution above here, okay, is the same as picking the art max over actions of your sequence of beta t a q t a plus some g a and this g a are independent gumbel random variables So you might not know, but uh, a gamble variable, okay? So uh, the probability density F for a gamble variable G uh, is uh, uh, exponential, exactly, exponential of minus G minus E to the minus G. Uh, let me check if I am not. Uh, that's correct, okay? So it's a weird uh, uh, probability distribution. However, it has a it has a very simple, nice form, something like uh, this. Okay, and centered around zero. Okay, uh, so the uh, the the nice thing is not about the gamble variable, which is interesting in itself because it's related to extreme value distributions. But uh, apart from that. Uh, the, the interesting point here is that uh, uh, you can turn using this trick uh, your problem of uh, exploration by using some uh, uh, distribution, so by softening the maximum like you did here into a sharp maximum, but now you have to put uh, your exploration bonus here. So here, what, what I want you to, uh, to, to take home is that uh, you can do two different things. Either you choose to the R max and then soften it before, or you modify your estimates because here you are modifying your estimates in a way, and then you do a sharp R, R max on your problem. Uh, why am I uh, insisting on this? because this kind of approach in which you modify your estimates uh, connects with a class of algorithm, which are called upper confidence bound algorithms. Uh, which basically express the following idea. So uh, in short, you have your uh, current estimates uh, for your actions, and you must add some bonus uh, for each of the actions. Uh, 
so these are basically your empirical averages. And here you add some bonus, uh, which uh, takes the form, uh, uh, in particular, for this algorithm, like under certain conditions like uh, this. Okay. And then you take the argmax. Okay. So you construct your vector of estimates, which are your empirical averages here. You add them some bonus, either random or non random, doesn't matter. And this bonus means, uh, tends to promote the choice of these actions that you have visited the list. So if you adopt this uh, uh, correction with this exploration bonus, then your UCB algorithms are probably near optimal in the sense that they got, come very close within the uh, live obvious bound, okay? So this is important, uh, just as a side note, to say that there are very many ways of uh, uh, mixing in exploration together with your greedy policy, but they fall into two big classes. One big class is just to perturb your estimates, which is the second one. And the other one is to soften your arguments. Okay, fine. Now we make, I think we've made a tour of many different choices. So if you happen to encounter them in the literature, you, they should uh, somehow be not uh, uh, completely uh, obscure to you. Uh, and this is a, definitely a good point to stop. And in the second half, we will go back to our uh, original program that is to use this exploration enhanced uh, learning to uh, achieve optimal control uh, for of an MDP without a model, okay? Any questions so far? No, you look exhausted. Maybe Can yes. I make a question? Yes, please. Um, I didn't understand uh, what is the link between the entropic regularization and the Boltzmann, Boltzmann exploration. Uh, are they the same thing or uh, this one. are they? Yes, this one yeah. and the previous. One. Yes, this this is, uh, they are exactly the same thing as you say, in the sense that the result of this optimization, the solution is this. You can work out the calculation if you write down explicitly this form. And then you take the derivatives and you maximize over the policies, respecting the fact that they have to be normalized. So if you do this simple exercise of finding the maximum over the policies, that's the result you get. So they are the same thing. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any other question? Okay, so let's take a break and uh, we reconvene at uh, uh, say 10 past 10, okay? Yeah. All right. So now we are ready to discuss uh, uh, in, uh, in general the uh, uh, the algorithms for uh, uh, reinforcement learning in model free case. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, 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 yeah, so. So we want to, like we said, we want to control our system in general for a generic uh, uh, macro decision process. So what we're going to do now, we're going to write uh, a sort of master uh, code, uh, and then we we will see how can we can implement uh, the various modules of this master code in different ways, uh, master algorithm in different ways, uh, depending on choices that we, we might want to do and what are the differences uh, and advantages. Okay, 
So uh, the, the basic structure of our uh, uh, algorithm uh, is works like uh, this. So initially uh, you have to uh, uh, initialize uh, your uh, parameters. Okay, so you define uh, uh, the state of space, uh, you define uh, your learning rates, uh, initial learning rates, or your initial exploration rates. Uh, okay, it's a sort of a general procedure. Uh, and then uh, you initialize your uh, estimate uh, of the Q function. Okay, so uh, this is an estimate. So you, it should have a hat on top of it, but uh, let's. Uh, 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 Let's not add it in order to, to not to uh, overburden the, the notation. So this is your initial guess for the Q function. Okay. And then you have a loop that starts here, uh, which does the following. Uh, so uh, you may you may want to, so this is another uh, uh, possibility. Uh, you may want to break your learning into episodes, okay? So you may want to run your update for some time and then restart again somewhere. So this is one possibility. In order to account for this possibility of having multiple restarts, in a, which is pretty natural if you have a goal task, so your episode ends and then you restart it. But even if that, it doesn't end, at some time you say, okay, maybe I stop here because my value function is not increasing any longer, so I restart. So in, in order to include this, uh, uh, this possibility, we can have a loop over episodes. And at the start of every episode, we have to start from somewhere, okay? So the first thing we do, we initialize a state, okay? So we pick up a state, according to some uh, uh, initial distribution that we choose, uh, which should be uniform enough in order to allow the system to visit uh, different states. Uh, once we uh, have that, uh, we uh, derive a policy pi from Q. So what does that mean? Uh, for instance, this is the part where we have to use to balance exploitation and exploration. So for instance, with some epsilon greedy. Or softmax or your favorite choice uh, of uh, exploration. Okay. Uh, once you have that, uh, you can uh, choose an action A according to your policy pi. And now you take action A and you observe the reward and the new state. So once you have that, uh, now here enters uh, two submodules, if you wish. Uh, so the first one is uh, uh, compute the temporal difference error delta. And the second one is compute the eligibility trace E. This is a, a matrix. E is a matrix because it has eligibilities for states and for actions here, since we are working with state action values. So we will make everything uh, explicit in the following, but here these are two, uh, two functions, if you wish. Uh, which uh, can have different content depending on the specific algorithm. So these two parts are algorithm dependent. OK, 
And today we will mostly discuss what to do about the temporal difference error. And we will keep uh, the eligibility simple, but you can combine the two. These are basically two different independent ways of combining things. You can have eligibility traces, which could be TD Lambda or whatever. Uh, there are several variations on the theme. Uh, it's a very rich field in itself. It's very well covered by the book of Sutton and Barto, as well as this part, of course, but uh, for, for in the interest of time, we will uh, specifically uh, uh, focus on uh, the part of computing the temporal difference error, okay? Good. Uh, then when once this is done, uh, we update our few metrics. Okay, so this is a often used the sim symbol to mean that you we are updating. So our new queue comes from the old queue plus some learning rate, which can be dependent on time, on action, etc. Let me use this symbolically. Uh, times the temporal difference error, which is a scalar, it's a number, it's a real number, times the eligibility trace, which is in general a matrix. Okay, so this is a, Q is a matrix, state action matrix, this is a state action matrix, this is a real number, this is a real number, which depends, of course, on Q implicitly, and this is the eligibility trace, which depends on uh, the past history of uh, actions and states that have been that are being listed. Fine. Uh, and then what we do basically is that we uh, we call our new state as the old state and the loop. So this inner loop here, this is another loop. This inner loop here ends, okay? Because we have produced a new state and we can restart from the state that we have here at this stage, okay? So the loop, the inner loop basically is this one. Okay, so we have this one episode and we may have many of them by refreshing our S at random and repeating this loop. So this pseudo algorithm uh, under appropriate choices of the functions uh, that are algorithm dependent here, uh, which we will discuss in a second, and the LGBT traces, so this part is, sorry. This part is algorithm dependent. Uh, converges uh, with probability one to the optimal solution of the Bernard's equation, given a proper scheduling of exploration and learning. Okay, so for the learning rates, you know how they should look like according to the sufficient conditions by uh, 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 Robinson Morrow. And for the exploration rate, you know that you have to choose them carefully uh, and for epsilon greedy, a good choice would be basically close to the inverse uh, number of times that you visited that state action pair, right? Good. So, uh, so in this uh, uh, sort of super algorithm, we can then uh, specify different choices for our uh, computation of the temporal difference error, okay? Uh, so, and also for the eligibility traces, but uh, let me uh, put here a little break and say in the following. Uh, we just focus on uh, the eligibility trace of a certain state uh, uh, and action. Uh, it's just gonna be uh, one, for the state that I've just visited and for the action that I've just taken. Okay, so this is the simplest uh, choice of eligibility traces, which corresponds to the algorithm TD node, which means that all the, all the errors that I'm observing are to be credited to the last 
uh, state action for reliability. So there is only one entry of my Q matrix here that changes at each time. And it's the entry which corresponds to the state action pair that I've just visited. This is, of course, a limitation, but uh, it allows us to write down, uh, to, to focus uh, on uh, the uh, interesting part, which is to how to compute the temporal difference error, which is this part here. On the book by Sutton and Barter, you, you see all these things combined in different flavors. Okay. So uh, when it comes to how to compute different uh, uh, estimates for the temporal difference error, uh, we will now review uh, three possible uh, situations which uh, cover a lot of, uh, 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 of the work that has been done in the last uh, 30 years, basically. Um, and the first of these is uh, called an algorithm which is called uh, SARSA. Uh, SARSA is a quite uh, trivial acronym for uh, state action reward state action. Okay? Because the way in which the temporal difference error is constructed here requires the evaluation of an additional state and action with respect to, of an additional action with respect to the usual stream uh, uh, that we use for that. Let me be more explicit. So. Uh, in SARSA, the, the recipe for the temporal difference error uh, is the following one. Uh, is uh, yeah, it's just the reward plus gamma. My current estimate at the new state and the new action minus Q S A. So this is closely resemblant of the recursion formula for the Q value. Okay, you remember that you have to uh, average the average of this delta is exactly exactly the uh, recursion relationship. Okay, so this is a very natural choice from the viewpoint of stochastic approximation. Uh, you will notice that one key aspect is that you have to choose in advance your action A prime that you will use in the following, okay? So this requires a double extraction of actions, which are the two A's in SARS. So how do you pick that action? Well, you use always the policy derived from Q, okay? So A prime is taken from the same policy derived from Q. So you use this policy twice in SARSA. You use it once when you choose the first action here, and you use it also in the belly of this function, inside this function, to compute a new action A prime, according to the same policy that you are using at the moment, in order to construct your temporal difference error. And then you return, okay? So uh, this is one possible choice. Now we will uh, uh, see another possible choice and we will highlight the uh, similarities and the differences. Uh, the second choice is called Q learning. And the temporal difference error in Q learning is defined as follows. So you notice the, the slight, the subtle difference between these two uh, in what is happening at in, in defining what is the Q value that you are comparing against for the future, for the next step. Here you're taking the maximum of your Q function. So you're using a greedy choice just to evaluate the function, not for the policy, the policy still is epsilon greedy, but you're using 
this maximum to evaluate a term in the, the temporal difference error. This makes it more similar to what you have in the Bellman equation. Okay. So this is closer, SARSA is closer to the recursion equation. Q learning is closer to the Bellman's equation in that you take a maximum of your estimate. These are some advantages and some risks. The advantage is that this is more aggressive, okay? And you go closer to your uh, best policy, but also being more aggressive in a sense, explores less in, inside this choice, okay? In, in the term exploration is a little bit uh, of a misnomer here. Uh, but you sample less because you are not given the possibility of sampling this. Of course, if you sample here, you have more noise because you are sampling another random action. So this object here fluctuates because of choices in different A prime that you might have. This one doesn't. So uh, the good thing is that both algorithms provably converge to the optimum. Okay, so if you schedule appropriately your learning rates and exploration rates, both of them converge, but their finite time performance could be very different. So before convergence, they might be doing very different things. Okay. So uh, in uh, Sutton and Barto, uh, there is a, a, an interesting example, uh, which is given, uh, which discusses the difference between uh, uh, SARSA and uh, uh, Q learning for finite time performance. Uh, and let's discuss it very quickly here. You can uh, see all the details on the certain bottom books. Excuse so, me. Yeah. Can I make a question for uh, yes, just just a small thing? What's the difference between uh, because I'm making confusion with the notation between the a uppercase prime and a lowercase prime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the upper cases here are meant to be uh, the states and actions that you observe or choose along your sequence. Whereas here, the lower case means just that that's the index of the matrix. Okay. So, right? Is it clear to anyone? Okay. This is just a formal operation over indices, the one that you have here. So you have your matrix, you just look at all the rows. You just look at the row with the S prime, which you have just visited, and you look at all the columns and you pick the maximum. And all this S and A means that you are focusing only on that particular item in the list. Okay. So the example that uh, Sutton and Barta discuss is called uh, uh, cliff walking. Which, in a nutshell, uh, it's uh, it's a grid world problem, uh, in which uh, so your interest of going going from a start point here to a goal point here, and here there is a basically uh, the, the the edge of a cliff. Here is the cliff, the cliff. So basically, if you step on the cliff. Uh, you get a, a very, very negative reward. So this region here, you get very negative rewards because this means that you're stepping off the cliff and you're crashing down and you will be badly hurt and it will take you a lot of time to recover, okay? In, in common words. Uh, at the same time, you get a, a, a penalty for every time you walk onto the ordinary part of the cliff, which is just the cost because time is going by. So the basic idea is that you want to go to the goal with the, with the sharpest, sorry, the shortest path, which is something like this, because you want to get there in the shortest possible time. But you don't know that the cliff is there. You're basically, you're 
it's a little bit like you're blinded and blindfolded and you don't see the cliff at the beginning you start out and you just have this map with you can sort of uh, mark down the points that you have visited okay the usual thing is model free uh, learning you don't have a, a map of the system you just have to learn by experience what is the best way to to do and uh, uh so when uh, when you run uh, uh when you run sarsa on this algorithm uh again with fixed exploration rate so we're talking about finite time performance of sarsa not the asymptotic one, which is optimal for both. So typically SARSA, what it does, it just goes about uh, like this. And takes a, a safer path, okay? So this is the safe path. Why does it do like this? Because there is this, uh, second action that is taken. So it looks uh, one action ahead in the future. And if it steps on the cliff, it realizes that this is gonna be very bad. So this motivates it to go through the safer path. On the other hand, Q-learning works much closer to the path, to the cliff. So Q-learning learns a policy which is closer to optimal, but the performance in terms of the reward is lower because it falls off the, clock, the, the cliff much often because there might be noise in the transition, et cetera, okay? So you see that these two algorithms, even though they have the same asymptotic guarantees, when you just see how they work in practice after a certain number of episodes, they may display different behaviors and this, uniquely depends on the only difference that there is, that is how you estimate your temporal difference error. If you estimate it uh, using one kind of policy and, or another one. And this is the first remark. The second remark about the difference of these two, is that uh, SARSA, you, you see, uh, always uses this policy pi both for choosing actions and for estimating okay pi here this new action here is estimated using the same policy this is the same as in core algorithm q learning uses a policy to choose actions, but uses greedy to estimate. Now greedy, you can think of greedy just like another policy. So this is why usually we uh, say that uh, SARSA does on policy estimation And Q learning does off policy estimation. So this is a degree of freedom which you can use and sometimes is useful to use off policy estimation. So you, you act according to a policy, but then you want to, to sample your future according to another policy, which maybe works better. So in applications from computer science, it's, it's absolutely legitimate. If you think about uh, sort of the, the neural interpretation of reinforcement learning, that is how it works in our brains or uh, in decision-making in animals, it makes uh, a little bit less sense because you cannot sort of disentangle these things that you are doing and sample in a different way, okay? So it's less intuitive. Uh, but both things exist and are, and this distinction is very important because uh, as we will see uh, in, in next lecture, not tomorrow, but the next week, 
When you combine these approaches with the function approximation, the com because now we're working in the tabular situation in which we work with states and actions which belong to Markov decision process. But the next step will be to use approximations in order to deal with vast state action spaces. And when we combine in conjunction temporal difference learning, function approximation, and off policy, then disaster can ensue. So off policy algorithms tend to have troubles when they are mixed in with the uh, temporal difference methods and uh, uh, function approximation. Okay, nothing to be worried about at this stage because this is something we'll discuss next time, but this is just to introduce already from now the notation of what is on policy and what is off policy. Okay, uh, one more thing. Uh, we can have another choice, which is inspired from Sarsa, uh, which is the following one. Uh, do we really need to make a, to take another sample according to the policy pi, or can we do something else? Maybe something smarter. And this possibility is what is called expected Sarsa. So the idea is similar, but now we replace uh, this random estimate here with the average with respect to the policy. Explicitly, in expected SARSA, the temporal difference error is the reward plus gamma. And here I'm putting sum over A, policy A plus prime, or let me put A prime. So or <clears throat> Okay, so you see the difference is, is in this middle term here, uh, which now is not a sample according to the policy, but it's already an average over the policy. So this is an operation that you can do because your, the policy is in your hands, is uh, the object that you have derived from your Q. So maybe it's epsilon greedy. So you use this explicit expression to combine the entries of your Q matrix in a different way. The advantage is that you don't have fluctuations any longer now. So this is reducing your noise in the estimate of the temporal difference error. And in fact, when you check for the performance, uh, so I'm not sure, but maybe tomorrow there will be also an example with expected SARSA, I hope so. Uh, you will see that the performance with respect to SARSA is increased. And this comes with no disadvantage because this still is on policy. Because you're using always the same policy pi to estimate your temporal difference error. So this, uh, there are uh, uh, less fluctuations. In delta and still on policy. So, in fact, there is a, a sort of a, a, a overarching scheme which combines a, a expected SARSA and Q learning, if you wish. Uh, so you can also view, so let's call it two bis, another view on Q learning. You can write down your delta as 
R plus gamma, sum over A prime of some other policy pi tilde Now, look at this, this expression here that I just wrote down. It's just the same one that I have for expected SARSA, except that now I'm using another policy here. It's not the same policy that I derived from Q in the previous step. It's another one, could be anyone. And in particular, uh, if pi tilde is the greedy policy of, of, from Q, so it's arg max of Q, then this thing is equivalent to Q learning. So by choosing your estimating, this is your estimation policy. If pi tilde is equal to pi, then you are on policy and then uh, everything is fine. And this is expected SARSA. But if your pi tilde is different, you have a continuum of choices which go from pi to the greedy choice. And the greedy choice corresponds to Q learning. Okay, so there is a, a full uh, sequence of algorithms that you can choose which interpolate between uh, expected SARSA and Q learning between the on policy and the off policy. Okay. So all these things are these three things are clearly related between each other as they should be, because all these choices for the temporal difference error eventually must converge to the Bellman equation. So it's clear that they cannot be totally independent from another from one another. But this is, allows us to sort of have a view of very different algorithms that have been proposed and uh, their relationships between them. Okay. So clearly the, this is was just a, a quick overview of the most important uh, uh, algorithmic approaches to uh, temporal difference learning. Uh, each of those may have better performances depending on the case at hand, depending on the choice of the other parameters. So there's a, a uh, whole uh, uh, set of uh, uh, competing uh, algorithms uh, that are slight variations on the theme. So we don't discuss them at all because uh, this is not the purpose of this, uh, of this overall course. The purpose is to give you some general broad ideas uh, from a high level uh, viewpoint. Uh, and, uh, but if you happen to open up a paper on uh, reinforcement learning, you should sort of be able that within this class of algorithms, which doesn't cover all the possible classes of algorithms, we will be discussing the very different architecture uh, in future lectures uh, that uh, connect to these ones, but only in part. Uh, so, but for this class of algorithms, uh, the basic concepts are already laid out in this uh, in this lecture. Okay, very good. So I think we're done for today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we will have tutorials on, uh, on this uh, uh, exercises, especially SARS and Q-learning and hopefully also expected SARS. With that, I'm done. And if there are any questions, OK. Uh, sorry, can I make yeah. a question? Please. Um, can we say again uh, what we mean when we talk about uh, episodes? Okay, okay. So I didn't discuss this much, but uh, let's let's consider, for instance, the problem of cliff walking. Okay. So how do you learn in this particular problem uh, the optimal policy? So let's look at the at the original pseudocode. Sorry, much here. Uh, so the first step is that you choose some initial state s, which uh, in this case will be the starting state here. And then you start a loop and you start with your guess q function, which maybe it's flat, it's totally zeros. So you take some first step at random 
then you pick an action uh, you observe some reward because there will be some cost either you walk off the cliff or you stay out and then you improve your queue etc and eventually eventually since the domain is finite either by chance or not either you fall you walk on the cliff uh, i mean you collect uh, many many penalties but eventually you end up in gold g and when you're there your episode finishes okay because you have reached the target one way or another and then you restart again from s but keeping in memory all the experience that you've done in your cube matrix so you restart over again with a new experience but with the cube matrix that you have learned so far and then you repeat this many times and each of these stream of data which brings you from the starting point to the goal point is one episode is that any clearer yes and thanks any other question okay if not have a nice day and see you tomorrow morning bye bye thank you goodbye thank you goodbye.